live everywhere. Daily Kos Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, Kagro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Now? Uh-oh. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Monday, November 18th, 2019, and time for yet another week-o shows. Did you have a nice weekend? Did you go to the hospital unexpectedly? Are you president of the United States? If so, contact us in direct messages. We'd love to talk to you. Uh, I don't know exactly what to tell you about that. This was a, It was actually a relatively quiet weekend for... A weekend in which the president made a possible emergency cardiac visit to the hospital and didn't say anything about it. Said he was in uh, perfect health. Perfecto, I think somebody said somewhere along the line. I didn't pay enough attention to uh, exactly what he was saying about the visit to care, only that uh, he had made one and was obviously lying about the conditions under which he made it. That was all we really needed to know. It kept him quiet for a while. You're not supposed to have your cell phone on in the hospital. So that's my, that'd be a good plan from, well, for the rest of the presidency, really. Would probably be pretty good. Uh, we'll see if there's any news on that or whether the White House admits to anything other than I think the cover story was, oh, yeah, routine physical. I just like to do it in parts. And I don't like to tell you anything about what the results were. And I don't schedule them ahead of time. You know, as normal people do. There's nothing normal about the way the administration works in any capacity, of course. Uh, oh, I skipped over this, but just uh, before coming on the air, ca- caught up on a, on a tweet from a while back that I just happened to notice. Totally normal thing for White House press secretaries to say, also apparently defending her record on, I don't know what, I'm not certain what record she thinks she has, but uh, letting everybody know that, yes, uh, you know, uh, just like normal White House press secretaries, everyone should know that, uh, that she has given plenty of statements that are truthful and accurate. And, uh, what's the big deal here? The, the vast majority, in fact, several of the things she said have been true and accurate. And how dare anybody question her? And how dare anybody question her answer to that question, which we don't even dare to ask her in the first place? It's, it's so normal, I don't even know what to do with things. Ah, there's breaking news this morning. Uh, how breaking is it? It's, it's breaking to those of you uh, tweeting it at me, but let's see. Uh, yeah, I guess it's relatively breaking. That'll be 8.59 a.m. That's about now. AFP, the French news, old Europe, and, uh, you know, the surrender people. That's what they like to say in the right wing, right? We denigrate the French because they never know anything about anything. And uh, blah, 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 and we're in a trade war over wine as well. Breaking news, though, from the French news agency, AFP. <clears throat> U.S. President Trump. Ta-da! That's it. <laughs> the news is your president, Donald Trump, says he will, quote, strongly consider, and I would say here, quote, strongly, quote, consider, strongly consider testifying an impeachment probe. I don't know that that qualifies as breaking news in the sense that it's not true. Um, one, he can't, I don't think he's able to consider anything. Certainly can't do it strongly. Third, I doubt very much whether they'll be testifying at any point during the, during the probe section. Um, but if he wants to, Hey, more power to him. That'll be fantastic. Uh, no objection here. You want to get on the stand and, uh, testify and answer questions from house members. I assume he thinks that, uh, by throwing a fit, in front of everybody and uh, firing back rather than answering questions that he'll do well. Uh, And, you know, I mean, all the the conventional wisdom is that in a situation like that, being an angry president and going on and firing accusations and calling people sleepy eyes and dopey and whatnot is not likely to work, but he is a totally different kind of politician and he gets away with things that we never thought anybody would be able to get away with. So I don't know. Roll the dice. It's fine with me. I think uh, we'd be happy to have him. Uh, Members of Congress have invited him to testify tongue-in-cheek, really. And I don't know whether he understood that to be tongue-in-cheek or or whether he did, in fact, understand it and thought, I'll show them to laugh. I'll have the last laugh here, and uh, I will testify. It's hard for me to 
Hard for me to tell when he's serious and when he isn't. Uh, this is the sort of thing that allow uh, occasionally throw out and and pretend that he thinks is a great idea and that'll totally work. And then whatever he just does his own thing, and uh, and then uh, it won't testify. And then later, when called on it, I thought you said that you were interested in testifying. He'll say, you know, I didn't, or that's fake news, or I would have testified, but they're so unfair that I totally changed my mind, or something like that. I don't know how long this lasts, but. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to rain on the French parade today. The French make the best parades. Uh, you know that already. The president has told you as much. We copy every parade we can from them. So, uh, you know, maybe it's time to follow their lead here. All right. Good morning, Greg. How are you doing? Good morning. Doing you? just fine. It's a little cool. Walter Reed. It's in the mid-30s. It's rainy. It's gloomy. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's fall. Yeah, well... Not for much longer, uh, another month or so, and then it'll be winter. So Yeah, and in a few months it'll be spring. And, you know, so things have their own uh, rhythm there, and you can't really hurry them up. And one of the other things you can't hurry up is public Love. opinion. Oh, yes. We have this uh, uh, first week of hearings under our belt. Same and, of course, thing. we have the very important Wednesday Gordon Sondland uh, um, crap show for him <laughs> coming yeah. up on Wednesday. Oh, yeah. Boy, that's a day for him. And uh, it's also the day of the Democratic debate, so it'll be a big day. But, uh, you know, there's there's a lot going on. And just in terms of summarizing it, I came across, uh, once again, because I often uh, wind up reading him not as regularly as I should, Dave Hopkins, uh, Mm -hmm. who is a political scientist, Ah. has a weekly, uh, at at his Honest Graft column, um, he's a political scientist at Boston College, and he has a weekly summary of what's going on in impeachment. So this week in impeachment uh, on Sunday, he wrote what I thought was just a, a, a brilliant summary of what we oh. saw All right. in the first couple of days. So the title is, uh, Why Can't Republicans Agree on What Happened with Ukraine? Oh. Uh, now, he's going to cover a lot of things, including uh, press releases, strategy, and all of that. And he says it's not that long. According to adorable truism of American politics, Republicans find it much easier than Democrats to unite around a single political message. Not all nuggets of conventional wisdom are reliably accurate, but this one has substantial truth behind it. The collective self-definition of the Republican Party as the agent of an ideological movement makes it easier for Republicans to employ a common set of rhetorical themes, while the more coalitional Democrats are routinely speaking to multiple audiences. As one satirical headline from The Onion put it, Democrats unveil 324 million new slogans to appeal to each U.S. resident individually. <laughs> we should. Right? We should. But that's pretty we much the Democrats. Get that okay, yeah. So when it comes to the current impeachment inquiry, I mean, just think about it. Nancy Pelosi says one thing, Steny Hoyer says somebody else, and then uh, oh. some, uh, you know, blue dog in Michigan says a third. Well, that's because they're all talking to different people. When it comes to the current impeachment inquiry, however, Yes. It's the Democrats who are collectively presenting a single theory of the case and Republicans who are trying so far unsuccessfully to find consensus on an alternative argument. The events of the week illustrate the extent of this challenge, for example, and the main sources from which Republican difficulties spring. Republicans in the House Intelligence Committee came to Friday's public testimony of former Ambassador Marie Ivanovich with clear messaging for the day. Adam Schiff is a liar running an unfairly partisan inquiry. To this end, they took turns reading into the record previous public statements by Schiff that he would seek testimony from the whistleblower whose actions alerted Congress to the Ukraine affair. Now, Democrats have been abandoning those promises lately as they found other witnesses willing to corroborate many of the claims the whistleblower's original uh, complaint contained. Republicans also executed a procedural set piece. So we get to talk about this once more. Oh, yeah, good. One of those almost clever public stunts of which both parties are excessively fond when relegated to the minority, in which Representative Elise Stefanak began speaking out of order, provoking Schiff to interrupt and deny her recognition. Stefanak and her colleagues then claimed that Schiff was abusing his authority in order to silence the only Republican woman on the committee. Now, the assumption behind this particular exercise was that Yovanovitch's testimony would not in itself be deemed newsworthy by the press. She had no direct contact with the president. Her deposition in closed session had already been released, leaving partisan sparks on the committee to represent reporters' biggest takeaway from the day's proceedings. But President Trump foiled his strategy almost immediately by launching personal (laughs) Twitter attacks on Yovanovitch. 
that were soon echoed by his son, stepping all over congressional Republicans' decision to treat her as a well-meaning but ephemeral public servant who was being misused by the real villains, the Democrats. Once Schiff read the president's words to Ivanovich, it was clear what the day's biggest media story was going to be. Republicans, normally reluctant to criticize Trump in public, didn't bother in this case to hide their frustration with his behavior. Mm Mm-hmm. So uh, he really hones in on the stunt, which is what it was. And by the way, as a result of that stunt, uh, Tedra Cobb, who is uh, the opponent that Stefanak beat by 14 points to uh, a year ago, uh, raised a million dollars. Yeah, uh, a lot of money raised. Uh, That's a lot of money. That's like she only raised a 1.5 million for her entire campaign last time. So uh, she's much better funded this time as to how well she does. That's the uh, upstate part of New York, everything north of Utica. If you look at a map of New York and you're looking at just the the, the top hat part of it, that's where uh, it is. And uh, it's a relatively conservative area, uh, rural, and it's uh, unclear whether or not her opponent uh, is actually going to make steps to to, uh, challenge her. But uh, this is a good first step Uh, in terms of doing that. You've got to raise the money. She certainly has the visibility. And uh, we'll see what kind of campaign uh, she needs to run. As we saw in Louisiana over the weekend, uh, the quality of the candidate matters. And so yeah, you have this situation. And by the way, uh, here's a, a technical piece, because we love to get into the weeds about these technical pieces here. Things I learned about uh, uh, how to describe what we saw on Friday, what actually happened behind the scenes, oh, talking okay. to some of the uh, uh, congressional reporters. I, I asked a simple question. Am I watching Yovanovitch at a hearing, or are these the hearings? And uh, actually, what? on Friday, a hearing took place. Yes. If you're talking about the Wednesday, Friday, it's hearings. If you're talking about what happened after the public part of the hearing ended, where they went behind closed doors and took a closed-door deposition it wasn't a hearing. It was a closed-door deposition. And in fact, things that I learned from the congressional reporters is that when you go down to the skiff, there's a room off of that, which has a uh, oblong table, like uh, many conference rooms, mm-hmm. and that's where you take depositions. I see. But the skiff itself actually has a dais similar to what we saw on TV, where there's a chair sitting you know, in, in front there. And they do conduct hearings there on occasion, like, for example, a hearing on uh, what the CIA is requesting for their budget. So you can have a hearing in the skiff, but that's not what happened on Friday. What happened on Friday was not a closed door hearing. It was a closed door deposition. So there was only one hearing. It took place during the day. And in fact, what happened is that Schiff gaveled it in and then they had a break to take votes. Then they came back and finished the singular hearing. Then they went to the closed door deposition and all part of that process, Schiff had complete and total control over it so that when Elise Stefanak tried to uh, uh, throw in that stunt, Schiff had none of it and said, those aren't aren't the rules. You can't do that and shut her down. And as to how well it worked, uh, well, you know, uh, obviously it's in the eye of the beholder, but, you know, we have some polling on that. And for the most part, uh, it, it really was the stunt that uh, Dave Hopkins was describing. So I think it, it would, you know, our assessment Thursday morning, I think, was pretty fair in terms of uh, our, our, uh, uh, of the first day. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, again, Friday hearing and then um, here for the show for the first time talking about it. So, um, you know, that's that's basically how it went. So getting back to Dave Hopkins, is impeachment a partisan witch hunt using career bureaucrats as dupes? Or is it a deep state conspiracy in which they, too, are implicated? Is Ukraine a loyal ally deserving of American military assistance that Trump ultimately authorized? Or did it treacherously intervene in the 2016 election on behalf of Hillary Clinton? Did the temporary withholding of aid had nothing to do with Joe Biden? Or was it a point of leverage to force Ukraine to crack down on corruption that the Bidens supposedly personify? These are the questions uh, Mm. I'm saying that that, uh, (laughs) Hopkins describes that Republicans haven't decided on yet. And that's why they're all over the place. Were Rudy Giuliani and Gordon Sondland freelancing without Trump's knowledge? Or were they carrying out a plan masterminded by the president? Well, the uh, existence of the phone call overheard between Sondland and Trump answers that question to the Republicans' dismay. It was was minded by the president. Are the executive's constitutional power so vast in the realm of foreign policy that no presidential act involving another nation could possibly be an impeachable offense? 
he's a student of the presidency. And, and these are reasonable questions uh, that, you know, kind of need answers here. So it's increasingly clear there's no common set of answers to the questions that both the White House and Congressional JP can agree on and stick to. Part of the problem is Trump is willing to give up a lot of valuable factual ground as long as the normative defense of his actions remains absolute. Celebrate him for committing murder, he'll thank you. Woe to the person who criticizes him for jaywalking. Hmm. Trump's inability to identify strategically counterproductive arguments on his own behalf have already caused him damage. After all, the precipitating event that gave House Democrats a, numerically, uh, a numerical majority supporting impeachment was Trump freely acknowledging to reporters he had mentioned the Bidens in the July phone call. Yes. So Republicans' Probably. inability to settle on a single overarching defense that fits the uncontested facts of the case isn't likely to shake the loyalties of Trump supporters, but it still makes a difference. Attentive elites in government, and this is where we get to how it's covered, uh -oh. and in the mainstream media are paying close attention to the impeachment process and are sensitive to the quality of evidence and debate on both sides. So far, the prevailing view holds Trump was at least up to something. And this judgment has noticeably colored press coverage and commentary. Several journalists opined that the past week was one of the worst that Trump's entire presidency. I got one on that, in mm. part because the effectiveness of the public hearings that began on Wednesday. As a matter of fact, uh, Kyle Cheney over at uh, Politico uh, summarizes it quite well. This has to be among Trump's worst weeks as president. Roger Stone was convicted to impeachment hearings. Attack on Yovanovitch backfires. Holmes, who is... Uh, Ambassador Taylor's aide overhears Trump Ukraine call, by the way, in a oh, oh, yes. Ukrainian restaurant where everybody, including uh, Igor Ivan and Boris Badenov, are all listening. Mm. And Rudy faces deeper legal peril and then the L.A. governor loss. So, you know, certainly that's the view of the press. Now, the media's reaction to Elise Stefanik's behavior on Friday was especially telling. Up until now, uh, Stefanik, Stefanik? I've said uh, I've, uh, Stefanik. Uh, Stefanik has enjoyed a status as a bit of a press darling as one of the few young Republican women in high level political office. And as a relative ideologic moderate, she's regularly received positive coverage as the media anointed face of a more modern Republican Party of the future. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, like Bobby sure. Jindal, Marco Rubio and Nikki <laughs> Haley fall into that, you know, kind of coverage, he says. Sorry. Um, mm, right. No, we serious. can laugh, but that's how they're often portrayed. But if the Washington yes. community saw the Democrats Probably march toward impeachment as a stretch on the merits or a loser on politics, journalists would have treated Stefanik's gamed out attack as a savvy maneuver Ooh. or the raising of a fair procedural point rather than as an attempted distraction by an ambitious Republican merely trying to ingratiate herself with the Trump dominated party, which, by the way, is how it was covered. Yes. Well, Good points well made by him in terms of how they wanted to frame it and how it was actually framed. Hmm. There are pre plenty of understandable reasons why the White House has prevented many potential witnesses from participating in the congressional investigation. And given what we know, it may well be that Trump's political interests would not, on the whole, be served by honest testimony under oath by his subordinates. No. But one cost to this blockade policy is there's few witnesses in these open hearings with the motivation to mount a defense of the president built on their own authority. This unfilled space places even more weight on congressional Republicans who must advance esculpatory arguments themselves rather than allow them to arise from the testimony of sympathetic executive branch officials. Maybe it shouldn't be surprising that the pro-Trump case so far is lacking the ideal amount of internal coherence. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a pretty good summary of where they're at. I know what they're trying, yes, uh, but it doesn't often work. And uh, here's a fascinating, uh, you know, sort of conservative look at that no. from a, a very unlikely player. All right. And that's Jonah Goldberg. Jonah Goldberg. OK. And in his newsletter, uh, and what I'm trying to newsletter. do is just to uh, give David uh, up to date. I've, I've sent him all the stuff, but it's in out of order of how I'm presenting. So I'm trying to it. send David the actual okay. pieces that he could read along. That's got to be him, right? The picture. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> in his newsletter, he, he tries to make a sports analogy, maybe soccer. Oh, excellent. Or football, playing the position versus playing the man. I see. He's a big uh, athlete. Two different ways of navigating the Trump year. I, I just think of, you know, when my kids are playing soccer in like third grade, you throw the ball down and everybody, including the goalie, would run to the ball. <laughs> right. OK. Right. Yes. That's what happens when you first start to play soccer. And then you learn. No, no. The goalie's supposed to stay in the net. The defenders are supposed to stay in their areas. Let the other people chase the ball. Yes. Advanced. Okay? So 
What does that all mean? Well, uh, it, it goes like this. One of the most interesting contrasts of the Trump era is between John Bolton and Mike Pompeo, who, by the way, according to news reports, is really in trouble with the president. And uh, Brad Parscale probably is, too. I think both of them said, you know, have their food tested and, mm-hmm. and maybe tasted before they actually have any. Yeah, they blind. highlight two archetypes of Republicans in the age of Trump. I think of them as playing position versus playing the man. Both men took their jobs to get things done, to be in the mix, to enhance their political positions and all that. But Bolton had ideas, agendas, principles that were more important than being a Trumper or being seen as a Trump loyalist. He wanted nothing to do with Giuliani's drug deal. He opposed the holding up of aid to Ukraine. We'll no doubt learn more when his book comes out, because that says he won't testify. But it's obvious that he prioritized policies he believed in. And I have no doubt there were compromises and humiliating moments of suck uppery. But the truth of it is still clear. As for Pompeo, he plays the man. He's been willing to lie and compromise for Trump in ways Bolton wouldn't. I'm sure he tried to steer president away from all kinds of mistakes. But when push comes to shove, he puts the president's cult of personality and perhaps the hope of inheriting his mantle ahead of everything else. So all this Ukraine stuff happened because Secretary of State Pompeo allowed it to happen. He may not have liked whatever drug deal Giuliani was cooking up, but he lacked either the will, the ability or the courage to stop it. Ultimately, it's a difference between two kinds of people. There's those who, for whatever reason, start from the view, at least publicly, Trump is right, and then reverse engineer their argument to fit what he did. Mm -hmm. And then there's those who may praise or flatter Trump or excuse the behavior, but do so in pursuit of something more important to them. And Jim Mattis comes to mind in that latter category. These two styles can be found all over the GOP and Trump world generally. Mitch McConnell plays the position. Lindsey Graham plays the man. Matt Getz is a Trump man no matter what. Liz Cheney plays the position. Tucker Carlson, for the most part, tries to play the position. But Sean Hannity plays the man. Neil Cavuto is a position guy. Dobbs is almost literally high on Trump's musk. Mm. Levaney yeah. was a position guy, but he seems to cross over. Same is true of Elise Stefanik, who has shocked a lot of people in Washington by seemingly deciding to follow in Jim Jordan's footsteps when it was totally unnecessary for her politically. Yes, now, Mike Pence wants the world to think there's no contradiction between these two orientations, which is why it's so painful to have the sound on when his lips are moving. Hmm. So, so that's, I think, a pretty decent, from the conservative point of view, summary yes. of what we're all seeing here. And uh, l- let me just uh, give you an example, I think, because I, I found it refreshing because it helps to explain how annoying people like Hugh Hewitt and Byron York are, Hmm. because these are folks who are clearly playing the man, but pretend to play the position. And it's that pretense that is just so annoying because we all know it's not true. Here's Hewitt, for example, a tweet describing a Sunday show from this morning. Our one, or uh, it must've been yesterday's, our one of today's show used audio from Sunday shows and interviews with Mike Allen and Selena Zito to lay out the fact that Adam Schiff's impeachment hearings, a complete flop with voters outside of the tiny resistance. It's an absurd show trial and it's getting worse for Democrats every day. In other words, he claims to do it based on data. But what's the data? Well, a new ABC Ipsos poll out this morning, 70 percent of Americans say Trump's actions tied to Ukraine were wrong. Mm -hmm. That's bad. Right. Slim majority, 51% believe Trump's actions are both wrong and he should be impeached and removed, but only 21% say they are following the hearings closely. However, in addition to the 51%, another 19 think Trump's actions were wrong, but he should either be impeached by the House but not removed or not impeached at all. And only 25% think Trump did nothing wrong. That's a true Trump base. And 25% mm-hmm. is a pretty good number. Yeah. I'm happy with that. That's similar to Nixon when he resigned since. It's been pretty consistent. Okay. Yeah. Nearly one in three or 32 percent say they made up their minds about impeaching before the news broke. And here's the part that I found interesting. It's not that number. Twenty one percent actually made up their minds about impeachment after the first week. And among those who said that, 60 percent think Trump should be impeached and removed. Hmm. So there's a sliver of the population. Twenty percent. Twenty one percent. That's that's big. You know, when when you're talking about election uh, results and close elections. And, uh, you know, nearly uh, 60 percent or six out of 10 who actually are hearing about and watching the hearings were pushed into thinking Trump really did something bad. And that's especially true. Excuse me. That's especially true after Friday, because, again, Wednesday, uh, Bill Taylor said, I don't understand what was going on. They closed us off. And by the way, uh, one of my staff members overheard why. 
And then Friday, Ivanovich says, I don't understand what was going on. They closed this out. But even if there are excuses for why they did that were legitimate, why did they have to defame me and get rid of me? It doesn't make any sense unless they were trying to cover something they didn't want me to know. Right. And that's basically what happens. And then this coming Wednesday, Gordon Sondland comes and says, well, here's what we didn't want them to know. And I have firsthand knowledge because I was on the phone call along with 12 other staff members and the entire uh, restaurant yes, right. and all of Boris Badenov's uh, listening posts. Uh, Natasha was on it, too. We all know. And so Wednesday, I think, is going to be fairly explosive. But that's why you can't look at public opinion now and say, OK, I know how these hearings are going to go. You don't because you don't know the impact of hearing it said. And it isn't just hearing it said. Most people don't listen, although there was this wonderful tweet about somebody on a plane on oh, Friday. Oh, yes, I saw that, yeah. Right? Where everybody on the plane was glued to them, not that you can go anywhere else, right, uh, sure. that was glued to the monitor, every monitor watching the same thing, which was Yovanovitch testifying. Yes, it's, you know, uh, uh, relatively wealthy people who fly, and it could have True. been, uh, you know, not exactly a scientific slice of the public. But the point is, that they were watching. They were all watching the same thing. That never happens on a plane. And uh, yeah. as one of the reporters said, everybody in uh, Washington on the Republican side is trying to say, nobody really cares about impeachment. But every time I leave Washington, the first question I get is, what's going on with impeachment? Ah. Well, so, you know, it, it turns out people it, watch. It, it takes repetition and headlines to get this stuff through. And that's what's happening with this. And that's why you got to wait another week to really see the impact. OK, well, we'll have another week of hearings. So we will have that week. We don't even have to, uh, you know, let the uh, you got to watch the next week to see what happened last week. And the effect was. You sure. got two weeks to see next week. We'll throw in a couple extra hearings maybe next week as well. We'll see. I mean, the president says he wants to testify. Maybe that'll be the, uh, yeah, the apex selfie. of it all. We'll be back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the Kid Grow in the Morning Show here on At Roots Radio. All right, I think we'll continue on here. I, I enjoyed hearing all about the hearings. So, oh, by the way, I guess one handy guide for uh, determining whether you are reading about a hearing or a deposition, it won't necessarily tell you whether it's a deposition or not, but if you can turn on the television or radio and hear it while it's happening, that's a hearing. And if you can't hear it, it's happening, it's because it's happening behind closed doors. And uh, that doesn't necessarily make it a deposition. They do have closed hearings, but that's a one handy guide. If I heard right, it on it the is, radio or on the television, it was a hearing. Well, you know, again, it's really annoying to have a closed door hearing where you can't hear it. Right. I mean, they hear it, but that's yeah. the, that's the important part. They do have such things. But they do have such things. And uh, not just the Intelligence Committee, but uh, other committees as well. They're They're relatively rare outside of the Intelligence and Armed Forces well, sometimes you just say, well, we'll go into executive session. Yes. it's a, it, Well, that's the equivalent of doing it yeah, on the floor. Uh, although, well, not in the Senate. They don't have, Executive session in the Senate could be something else as well. Never mind. I'll explain all of that later. But, yeah, the depositions are closed. These are – and it's hard to tell the difference largely because we get uh, transcripts eventually, for one thing. So we do eventually hear about what they said. And the opening statements – leak pretty quickly too that was the friday flurry of activity with holmes's deposition his opening statement was handed over to cnn early in the early stages of his deposition testimony and read on the air by the reporters and uh, that's where we learned all about exactly how populated the restaurant was etc cetera, etc cetera, and the, the, the physical dynamics of how that stupid call leak happened right 
Uh, it wasn't okay. that it was on speakerphone. It's that Trump speaks so loudly yeah. that everybody could hear it. So uh, like this him. is a piece by Ryan Hello. Goodman I hadn't previously sent you, no. All right. which I thought was Bottom interesting. Man. And that's, remember, Ambassador Kurt Volker is part of this. Yes. You know, uh, Gordon Sondland, Rudy Giuliani, and Kurt Volker were all working to try to get Ukrainian public announcement that there'd be an investigation. Yes, right. Only purpose was not to actually investigate, but to be able to use it in sound bites and ads yes. against Joe Biden. That there was and this piece by Ryan Goodman says, Ambassador Kurt Volker faces a serious credibility problem for having denied knowledge or involvement in President Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani's efforts to press Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden. Uh, yeah, that would seem to have been the wrong play now. Yeah, at at the time, it seemed like a CYA kind of thing. Remember, not all of the witnesses are friendly. Some are hostile. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Tim Morrison, uh, NSC aide, is going to be pro-Trump and hostile to the Democrats. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that because people like Jim Jordan will say, we want their transcripts released because it would exonerate it, you know. Uh, so not everybody's like thrilled to be there. Gordon Sondland is going to be a hostile witness to the Democrats. And Kurt Volker was, too. He just is basically an ambassador. So therefore, he was a lot smoother about it. He also appears to have lied, says Ryan Goodman, no. about a crucial July 10th meeting at the White House and other related matters. Volker faces serious legal liability problem. He made those apparent false statements to Congress in his deposition under penalty of law. Remember, these guys are talking under oath here. The chart below presents detailed information comparing Volker's testimony sure. to the testimony of at least 11 other current and former U.S. officials oh. whose statements contradict what Volker told Congress. Volker was included in ranking member Devin Nunes' final list of minority witnesses for the public hearing. He is scheduled to appear on Tuesday afternoon. Mm -hmm. On the morning of October 3rd, Volker was the very first witness to testify in closed session before the three committees conducting the impeachment inquiry. Volker would have no way of knowing exactly which of his colleagues would later testify and what they might say. That's why they did closed hearings. Yes. Within hours of the committees Positions. announcing a subpoena for Volker, he publicly resigned from his position as special envoy to Ukraine. He thus had greater latitude to speak. Several of his colleagues, including David Holmes, that's the guy who overheard the phone call, George Kent, Ambassador George Sondland, Ambassador Bill Taylor, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vidman, did not resign. Now, all of their deposition transcripts and other testimony is publicly available. Volker's testimony was unfavorable to the president and Giuliani in many respects. However, in other important instances, Volker denied allegations about his own wrongdoing. That's why we called it a CYA kind of uh, a testimony and the existence of the alleged pressure campaign. Now, Sondland's original testimony was more closely aligned with Volker's until Sondland broke from that message and issued a supplemental deposition. And Volker, by the way, never did. Comparing Volker's testimony to other witnesses raises very serious concerns about his truthfulness. To be more specific, it appears Mr. Volker lied to Congress in violation of federal criminal law, 18 U.S.C. 1001. Yes, like Roger Stone. For those of you keeping score, the most serious instances include his flat denial of the Ukraine investigations. That's in scare quotes like hearings were discussed in a July 10th meeting at the White House. His denial of his own knowledge, his denial of his own involvement <laughs> and know, his denial know. of his own knowledge or involvement in a quid pro quo scheme and his claim that efforts to get Ukraine to make a public statement ended in mid to late August. Volker now has a choice to make before he appears before Congress and the public on Tuesday. That would be tomorrow. He might be best advised to invoke his Fifth Amendment right. Alternatively, he might want to issue a supplemental declaration of his own, which, again, I point out he hasn't done. Mm -hmm. Or he could include a clarification related to his prior statement, like uh, this statement is inoperative, signed Ron Ziegler. Mm. Uh, that was Nixon's press secretary who used to work at Disney Land, who used to say that all the time. None of this. Ne I'm old. What can I say? None of this necessarily casts blame on Volcker for his actions. It appears he was caught in the middle of a complex problem, not of his own making. As a seasoned diplomat, he tried to steer the situation toward an end point in which Ukraine could meet the demands of the president to maintain U.S. support. I therefore faced the choice. He said, do nothing and allow the situation to fester. Try to fix it. I tried to fix it. With Congress now in a full-blown impeachment inquiry, Volcker has a second opportunity to explain with complete candor what really happened. Ah. So that's... Of interest. And I think that's uh, therefore that's Tuesday, although the more explosive one will be Wednesday with yes, uh, Gordon well, we'll Sondland. Uh, 
Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, even without it being explosive, uh, interesting to see uh, from a media perspective who chooses to cover how much of what. I noticed that uh, by the time Jovanovic testified, many of the networks had opted out of preempting daytime soaps and talk shows because they had been told that the previous round lacked pizzazz and then there was lots of pizzazz and they missed except, it. That, except that the audience was twice what normally – uh, their daytime shows get so yes. that wasn't it. But they, but pizzazz. Am I yeah, wrong? that's what Jonathan pizzazz. Allen said for go. NBC. It lacked pizzazz, except there was enough pizzazz so that there was a phenomenally uh, interesting and uh, and detailed. Uh, watched on the plane. Uh, watching from the plane. Now I, I actually covered it on Saturday, mm-hmm. in the Saturday uh, pundit roundup. I kind of you know summarized all the pizzazz stuff. Pizzazz. Yes. Uh, right. Because there was quite a bit of it, um, and in fact, uh, you know, you could, you could. Uh, uh, Jonathan Allen on Wednesday wrote plenty of substance, but little drama on first day of impeachment hearing. The first two witnesses called Wednesday testified to Trump's scheme, but lacked the pizzazz necessary to capture public attention. That's what he wrote. Yes. Okay. However. <laughs> Whoever choreographed the Roger Stone verdict with the impeachment hearings and the mm-hmm. Trump witness intimidation tweet on Friday, I wrote, is a deep state genius. Yes. <laughs> because there was plenty of pizzazz for that. And by the way, the very fact that David Holmes, Ambassador Taylor's aide who overheard the phone call with Boris Badenov and the rest of Russia in the Ukrainian restaurant was revealed on Wednesday. That was an enormously important piece there that Alan just refers to as, oh, oh you know, yeah, another not, tidbit. Not it was more than that, which we'll see on Wednesday. Yes. Uh, and then uh, and then by Friday, I thought that was a really interesting decision even to have his deposition so late on a Friday, knowing that, you know, you would likely miss the news deadlines, perhaps, and people would be tuned out. But uh, it was like just one last coup de gras at the end there, you know. Uh, right. One just really capped a terrible week and sent people into a tailspin for the weekend and, and, and Trump to the hospital for the weekend, as it happens. Well, as Mikey Yoyang job. wrote, uh, you know, these hearings have, uh, for those complaining about possess, these hearings have corruption, threats against ambassadors, here return villain mayors, henchmen named Igor and Lev, references to Miss Universe, a war with Russia where people are dying, throwing acid at reporters, midnight phone calls, fleeing the country under threat, Overheard phone calls from hoteliers turned ambassador, what? attempts to dig up dirt on a political opponent, a wayward son of a vice president who's dealing with the tragedy of his eldest son's death. I mean, that's pretty pizzazzy to what? me. Why? Okay. Yeah, that was a lot, a lot of things that I wasn't even sure where that got pulled from. But okay. Shoot. Well, it was you know, all of it happened. And all of it was, uh, you know, a lot of it was uh, Ambassador Ivanovich, who, by the way, got a standing ovation in public everywhere she goes. Yes. Now she's famous. Now she's famous. So uh, uh, contrast that, let's say, with Sarah Huckabee Sanders and uh, the reaction she gets when she goes out in public. Oh, yeah, right. I'm I'm just saying, you know. True. So in any case, uh, you know, that's really the background for a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a new Iowa poll out from um, uh, Iowa. uh, Seltzer, CNN, Des Moines Register. Okay. Members of both parties. This is interesting. See impeachment as a political winner in 2020, new Iowa poll finds. If you ask the Republicans in Iowa, they think they're doing great. Hmm. And if you ask the Democrats, they pretty much think they're doing great. But, of course, DNA between Republicans and Democrats are different. Republicans are fully confident even when the ship is sinking. Hmm. And even when the Democrats are winning, they're saying, I don't know. I hope we can make it to the finish line. True. Right. So 60 percent among registered Republicans saying the impeachment inquiry is more likely to make it easier than harder for President Trump to win election. Okay. But 26% say otherwise. You see, the thing about Republicans is basically, if they don't have 100% support, they're losing. That's the way you have to read this. Well, that's the way they designed their their playbook. Among likely Democratic caucus goers, 45% say the inquiry would make it easier for the Democrat to win compared to 24% who believe it'll make it harder. So there's, uh, you know, a quarter of each party is skeptical, but uh, Republicans just find it easier to say, nope, my leaders told me it was good, so therefore it's good. Okay. Well, now, when it comes to registered Republicans, 30 percent say they're following the inquiry close, very closely. Twenty five percent, they're following it fairly closely. And so if half of the Republicans are following it that closely. 
Okay. Yeah. They're going to learn some things that they don't really want to know. They really would like to tune out and not know this stuff. Yes. All right. For example, an overwhelming majority of registered Republicans in Iowa say the president didn't use his office improperly. And 14% think he did. That sounds like yes. a low number. But if you take 14% away from the president's total among his Republicans, that's bad for him. Nearly yeah. half of those who say they would consider or definitely vote for someone other than the president in the general election say he used his office improperly. Mm -hmm. Some of this stuff gets in. It raises doubts with a sliver of Republicans, and it's an important sliver. And just because it's not a majority doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Right? Can't yes. say that strongly enough. Right. They love Trump. They love Pence. They don't like Meh. his critics. Okay. And 76% say they definitely plan to vote to reelect the president. That's up nine percentage points since March, which clear majorities across nearly every demographic group. The only exception is moderates. 47% say they plan to vote for Trump. Okay. 76% say they definitely plan. Again, that should be 95. It's not. And so yes. I don't read these numbers as particularly strong for Trump. It doesn't show that the Republicans are breaking and half of the Republicans think they're loyal to the party, half think they're loyal to Trump. The exact numbers of 43% choosing Republican Party and 41% naming the president, but it's basically a 50-50 split there. Mm -hmm. And those signing with the GOP include Republicans under the age of 35, so younger people are a little more skeptical of Trump, uh, which we also see in a new uh, Harvard IOP poll of Ute. More than half of the Ute of America want Trump gone. But that's another story. That poll was taken in October, even before the hearing started. The groups with the strongest allegiance to Trump include those who call themselves very conservative evangelicals. Hello, that's yes. his base. Lunatics. And those who live in rural areas. Okay. I, there was, that's different. Right. And those rural areas are so key because basically that's what we saw happening in Louisiana. It's not that Louisiana all of a sudden became a blue state again. Not happening. It's a very conservative state. And the Democrat who won their governorship is a very conservative Democrat. Yes. Right? Pro-life, sure. pro-gun. Uh, but as many of the liberals in Louisiana said, I don't love him, but you got to support him because look at the alternative. And the alternative was uh, a uh, crackpot businessman, Eddie Rispone, who was totally backed by Trump to the point where Trump went there three times and pleaded with Louisiana to vote for him because it's a vote for me. Mm -hmm. And of course, he lost, just like he lost the Kentucky governorship, just like he lost the majority uh, in the Virginia legislature. Yes. So that was a really, really bad day for Trump. And what happened is that the suburbs, which used to be reliably Republican, turned blue. Hmm. That Just like so in surprising. Kentucky around Lexington and, and the uh, Cincinnati uh, area, uh, Kentucky suburbs. And so and, and just like what happened in Virginia. And so the message uh, to Republicans across the country ought to be fairly clear. Trump's mojo is draining and they are losing the suburbs over this. And so they're all watching that. It's not like they're not paying attention. They well know what's going on here. And there's a lot of calculation that they're doing in terms of, you know, what do we do and what's next? With people like Elaine Stefanik and, and Nikki Haley, uh, part of that is positioning themselves in a Trumpy uh, post-Trump GOP so that they themselves can be in leadership positions. And that may or may not work because when you anchor yourself to a sinking ship, that doesn't always end well. Yes, that is true. Uh, probably good advice to think about, but uh, so far that's the only play they've got. And right. I think that's been the it is the only play, play they've play got, which is why they're time. doing it. But it, but you're better off sometimes being quiet. And that's where um, I think uh, Jonah Goldberg's right about Stefanik. Mm -hmm. uh, she she would have been better off just being quiet. But she was the only woman, and they had to do it. They probably had a lot of pressure on her to. You have to go up and make a stunt because Jim mm -hmm. Jordan's coatless stunts aren't working the way we want. We need a lady to do it. That is an interesting angle on it that it, whether that happened or whether she volunteered for it and sold herself for the role based on that or well somebody decided yeah. to throw the that's part of to the her so therefore right. it was planned well yes uh, i'm just i'm curious about how the decision was made and who who was it in the strategy session who suggested whoa well, oh, you know you're the only republican woman on the panel and that would be good we like we could use that for he's shutting down a woman and I'm curious whether that was Stefanik saying, I can use that. I can use this leverage to get this role handed to me. 
or whether others said, oh, you know what we could do? You know what you could do? You could say, oh, it's a big deal because I'm a woman. And and then the question is, did she think that was a good idea, bad idea, but did it anyway? I'm a little curious about that, but yeah. hopefully well, she'll disappear you know, before in this, I find In out. this Trumpy GOP, it doesn't matter what you thought. What matters is what you did. <laughs> right. Well, that too. And uh, yeah, none, of, none of what you think is I don't want to hear really that behind true. closed doors you didn't think it was a good idea, but I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. You did it. That's not going to help you. That's true. You can't That's get out of it that help way. You. I'm just sort of curious as to how Everybody they make Everybody thinks decisions. it's a bad idea behind closed doors if you ask them, unnamed. Well, once it's gone bad, yes. Once it's gone bad. Right, exactly. That well, doesn't help. I thought this so was So this really is uh, Jonathan Martin and Maggie oh, Haberman writing in the New York Times. Way. President Trump bet big this election year. Here's why he lost. Oh, good. In Louisiana, Kentucky, Mr. Trump's political pleas appear to energize Democrats and political moderates as much as his own base, sending turnout in cities and suburbs soaring. That's the there message, uh, even if it's uh, perhaps more subtle than that. Uh, you know, quality of candidate. Everybody hated Bevan. Everybody liked John Bell Edwards. Bevan was incompetent. Bell Ed, uh, John Bell. Uh, John Bell is his first name. John Bell Edwards. JBE really? was uh, competent. You know, whatever. Uh, fact of the matter John is, Benet. Trump said. Do it for me. And that made it a loss for him. Yes. So when President Trump showed up in Louisiana now. for the third time in just over a month to try to help Republicans win the governor's race, he veered off script and got to the heart of why what? he was staging such no. an unusual political intervention. His attempt to lift Matt Bevan had failed, Mr. Trump explained, and it would look <laughs> bad for him to lose another race in a heavily Republican <laughs> state. You got to give me a big <laughs> win, please. OK, the president pleaded with a red hatted crowd last Thursday in Bossier City. Louisiana. <laughs> the names of the parishes and precincts there are fascinating, but that's another story altogether. Yes. And again, as J. Miles yeah. Coleman, who was mm -hmm. covering this, uh, pointed out, it's because Louisiana is based on Catholic French law. In fact, they use the Napoleonic Code, not the regular uh, everybody else uses it uh, codes uh, in the rest of the regular country. Regular America. So, so that's where the parishes come from. Yeah, true. Right. But on Saturday night, Mr. Trump's wager backfired in spectacular what? fashion. He Not only did Governor John Bell Edwards, a Democrat, win re-election by more than 40,000 votes, he did so with the same coalition that propelled Governor-elect Andy Beshear to victory in Kentucky, and that could put the president's re-election chances in grave jeopardy next year. Oh, my goodness. They're actually pointing out that he's got a uphill road for election. Yeah. Is there any other kind of jeopardy? Like Mr. Bashir, Mr. Edwards energized the combination of African-Americans and moderate whites in and around the urban centers of his state, building decisive margins in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Shreveport. It was a striking setback for a president who proclaimed himself his party's kingmaker, but is a decidedly mixed record when it comes to pushing his chosen candidates to victory in general elections, and it continued a November losing streak that included not only Bevin's loss in Kentucky— but a wave of state and local Democratic victories in Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Missouri that also were driven by suburban voters. So it's a big problem for him there. And by the way, another thing to recognize when you're looking at Southern black voters like in Louisiana, okay, yes. they are moderate conservative people. Uh, okay, yes. That's going to have huge implications for who they wind up supporting in the Democratic primary. But you got to get them to come out and vote. And how you do that isn't necessarily with Medicare for all. Uh, true. Yes. Well, that brings us back uh, at least tangentially to uh, the Rachel Bittacoffer modeling. Uh, I, I think a little bit. I was reminded of what you of that when you were talking about the differences between Republican and Democratic DNA and how you react to. The situation that Republicans are constantly confident that they're doing the right thing. Impeachment's working for them, despite all evidence that it is not. And Democrats, uh, you know, always looking out, looking, checking their back, thinking, you know, looking in the rearview mirror. Yeah, and Democrats in disarray. Republicans true. lined up. Right. Uh, however, you did point out what, what you had was 70, what, 76 percent or so uh Support for the president among Republicans who, you know, who thought that Iowa, Republicans yeah. were or who thought that impeachment was going well um, and still a minority it wasn't it was it was a large percentage, but it was still just under 50 percent, I guess, of Democrats who felt confident about it. 45, but that's usually yeah. even lower. And it, it actually reminded me of the way uh, Rachel Bittacoffer has been describing the turnout phenomenon that in these elections, Republicans are aiming to turn out their base and and juice t 
turnout with and succeeding. Yeah, and and succeeding. And so that's happening. They're getting more people than you a, a normal person would think would come out for Republicans because obviously everything's a disaster for them. And yet they get that 76% coming out. Uh Democrats of course always concerned about things, but they are even though they're not getting 76 on the other side with the, you know, with the equal opposite uh feeling necessarily. Uh, and they're always worried about not living up to what they need to do to perform. They, too, are boosting their turnouts. And the key really is our Democrats, you're not going to get Republican turnout depressed. It's probably just not going to happen. The only question is, can you juice Democratic turnout to overwhelm can you imagine the Republican? Exceeded. Um, yeah, it's the opposite think, playbook that George W. Bush used in Ohio to beat John Kerry. Kerry hit his targets and Bush hit his, but uh, W's targets were higher. So I'm wondering whether there's a parallel in sort of the optimism measurement. You, ordinarily, you would expect to see nearly 100 percent of Republicans saying we're doing great, but it's down to 76. That's an overwhelming number uh, in terms of absolute majority of the group. And, and lo- normally you see 76 percent in a poll. And you're yeah, on usually the other you side see of 5% it. Five percent of Democrats panic. thinking it's going well. Yeah, you panic about those things. Meanwhile, right? So you usually see five percent thinking it's going well. It's now in the forty pluses, but it's still not over fifty, which is what you would think of unless you knew what Democrats were about. So they are, in fact, I think Democrats exceeding expectations, and perhaps you know, in in that in that optimism measure, which isn't the same thing as turnout or votes. But I just uh, I think of it as a as a, an interesting parallel. The seventy six looks like an overwhelming number unless you realize that it's usually in the eighties and nineties. Right. And the forty six looks like a poor performance unless you realize it's usually in the twenties. Yeah, or, or the threes or the ones. <laughs> Democrats <laughs> just lucky. by definition are not confident. People in twenty sixteen destroyed whatever confidence the rest of them had. Okay, so uh, this. Uh, uh, New York Times piece I'm going to uh, just finish up with because it, it has some really interesting points here, specifically about the mm-hmm. South and suburbs. The results in Kentucky and Louisiana are particularly ominous for the president, in part because they indicate his suburban problem extends to traditionally conservative southern states, mm-hmm. Atlanta suburbs, I think, and may prove even more perilous in the moderate Midwest next year. They also reveal political weaknesses for the president at a moment he's embroiled in a deepening impeachment inquiry and desperately needs to project strength with his own party because otherwise they'll break with him because they know he's guilty. And I threw that in, not the New York Times, but then again, it's the New York Times. And as he enters what will likely be a difficult reelection campaign, the two states emphatically demonstrate that he's become just as much of a turnout lever for the opposition as with his own supporters. And then I love this quote from Tim Miller. If you had any doubt that Trump was a human repellent spray for suburban (laughs) voters who have a conservative disposition, Republicans getting wiped out in the suburbs of New Orleans, Louisville and Lexington should remove it, said Tim Miller, a Republican strategist and outspoken critic of the president. The Louisiana results are a stinging rebuke for the president because he spent so much time there and because Trump allies couldn't chalk it up entirely to local factors like they did in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And even before the Louisiana race was called on Saturday night, Finger pointing from the Capitol to the White House to Mr. Trump's campaign broke out about why he spent so much political capital on the race in the first place. Trump carried Louisiana by 20 points. By the way, he carried Kentucky by 30 and Mississippi by less than 20. And I was scratching my head for a microsecond and thought, gee, why is Kentucky so much Trumpier than Mississippi is? I would have thought Mississippi is much more conservative. And everybody on Twitter said, dude, Mississippi has black people. Ah, Kentucky does not. Kentucky is 8% black and Mississippi is is uh, in the 30s, 38, 40%, something like that. So that makes all the difference in the world. And again, they may, may be conservative black voters, but they're black voters and they're Democrats. Yes. Well, that does make a difference. That's the answer. All right. So, uh, again, an uh, uh, although we don't have a lot of time for that, think Pete Buttigieg and after he wins Iowa because he has a great uh, campaign there. And does, let's say, second, I'm making this this up, yes, in uh, right. New Hampshire. Making it what up. happens when he goes to South Carolina? How does it play? I don't know. That's that's why Biden's still in the race. So, yeah. you know, you got to factor all of that stuff in when you're trying to look at the t- totality of what's going on here. Fact of the matter is Trump had a really bad week. Those impeachment hearings were bad for him. They're going to get worse this week. People are watching and information does seep in by repetition, repetition, repetition. Let me say that again. It seeps in by repetition. How? Uh, you keep repeating stuff, and eventually people catch on. Okay. We can do that. We repeat this daily. 
Yeah, as a matter of fact, you can listen to the show live and then listen to it later by podcast. Right. So we'll over repeat it again. Let's put it on loop. So that's me. That's okay. it for today. This is Monday. That's uh, to set up your week. All right. And I guess uh, Kurt Volker tomorrow and Wednesday Sondland and uh, off to the races. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, oh, you know, one quick polling question just in general. I was wondering about yes. this. I don't know that they do this. this is, uh, uh, but very often when they're polling in primaries for w- when the seat is open on, on one side of the aisle or another, and you, you ask questions about people's qualifications and fitness for the office. And yep. I was wondering, I don't know, if, do they ever, they, I usually, I don't have paid attention anyway to numbers. Do they ask that about incumbents? Like, do yes, you they feel, do. Well, they asked it about Trump. I'm curious about whether they've ever done that before or not. And, and, and that I don't know, but you, they're certainly asking it about Trump. Cause it's a weird question. And it occurred to me the other day, this might be a situation, maybe the first one might be the first one we've ever measured. There, and there might not be any data. Ordinarily you wouldn't bother asking in the third year of a first term, is the incumbent president qualified for the job? Right. And do you feel that he's fit for office? And I'm yeah, it's, it's fascinating, right? Do you think uh, Trump is fit for office? It's, now that you've seen him, office. you really still think that? And and has any has ever has any incumbent president ever had lower marks for fitness for office and qualifications in the third year of his presidency than he did when he was in a candidate initially? Yeah. Like, in, have you spent three years proving you shouldn't be there? And I I. Wondered whether there was any. Well, we'll find out. Maybe we'll dig around. But uh, okay, as long as they ask that about Trump, that means we'll find out the answer to, to that question right. at some point. Okay. So I'll, I'll see you on Wednesday, Very good. and uh, we'll have at least uh, one impeachment hearing uh, yes. under our belt. Maybe some if not hearings. deposition ends. Sure, there should be plenty. Okay, thanks, Greg. We'll catch up with you later. Oh no! In fact, we actually have a few more seconds than I thought. So uh, I'll say it again. <laughs> How about that? Well, thanks for coming by. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll catch with you on Wednesday when the hearings begin again. All right. Take care. Welcome back, everybody, to the k in the Morning Show here on Roots Radio. And uh, all right. Yes, we've uh, taken our leave or he's taken our leave from us, Greg Dworkin, back on Wednesday, uh, the neighbor a little bit late in getting off to work, I guess, because we just heard Abby during the commercial break send him off. So all well uh, and uh, as it should be, just a few minutes behind schedule in case you were wondering. I, I guess the construction or at least the uh, loud machinery uh, associated with the masonry work was also absent today. So we happened to get away with that one too. All right, let's see what else we got here. And uh, can following on. Oh, let's see. What have you sent? Uh, Greg has just sent along another uh, interesting piece here. Ah, all right. Let's see. So Andrea Mitchell tweeting earlier this morning. Trump's impeachment ire turns on Pompeo amid diplomats starring roles. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me open up that piece. But then there's more comment about it. Uh, let me flip back here. I've opened it. There we go. And then Phil, Phil, Phil Burl. Is that the person's name here? Tweeting. Uh, hmm. Reconstructed transcript. The, the correct word is doctor. Okay. That should be very interesting because that's something I've been keeping my eye on too is, um, and we haven't really discussed it all that much, but yes, Trump, uh, I think was signaling early on to, to our way of thinking, signaling early on, that he intended to screw around with, that he wouldn't be above screwing around with what he was calling transcripts. We already have the non-transcript transcript transcript of the July 25th call. And then briefly, for some reason, he pretended that no one had ever heard of the April call, even though it was revealed right away in the whistleblower meeting or uh, a report. And uh, everyone had heard about it for weeks uh, months almost by the time he started pretending no one had ever heard of it. There's one of a series of things that he hears of for the first time or that registers with him for the first time. And then he figures no one else has ever heard of it, but he began, uh, insisting that Democrats on the impeachment committees were going to be doctoring these transcripts and putting out their own versions of things to try to frame him up in an effort to, drive public opinion on impeachment, which I think we rightly took as a signal that that meant he 
was going to be doing that and was looking to project that onto Democrats either before the fact or maybe he had already done so. Um, there were already some strange discrepancies. Let me see what this one discusses. If it's not the April call, then I'll see what it's all about here. Um, but the comment from Phil Burl, is that right? Um, seems to call out a certain part of this story here. Impeachment hearings, <clears throat> the subheader reads this story from NBC News. Uh, I guess I ought to start again. Trump's impeachment ire turns on Pompeo amid diplomats' starring roles. Impeachment hearings have created a rift between the president and one of his staunchest allies in the administration. I think Greg hinted at Pompeo being in trouble. The headline actually makes me think uh, that there might even be an element of Trump being angry with Pompeo and diplomats' starring roles, not so much because of the damage that some of these diplomats have done to Trump, but uh, why are they starring? Why am I not the one who's the star in all of this? And well, you don't want to be. You want to be keeping quiet. And all. No, no, I want to be in the center of attention, as usual. Carol Lee, Courtney Kube, K U B E, is he Kube? I don't, we've, we've wondered that before. And Andrea Mitchell on the NBC News byline here. The impeachment inquiry has created the first rift between President Donald Trump and the cabinet member who has been his closest ally, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, according to four current and former senior administration officials. No doubt all of them commenting with on condition of anonymity because reasons of scaredy catness. Trump has fumed for weeks that Pompeo is responsible for hiring State Department officials whose congressional testimony threatens to bring down his presidency, the officials said. The president confronted Pompeo about the officials and what he believed was a lackluster effort, that is to say it lacked pizzazz, I guess, lackluster effort by the Secretary of State to block their testimony during lunch at the White House on October 29th, those familiar with the matter said. So I guess reading between the lines here, Trump's been angry that uh, the people who testified against him were State Department employees. And why did they ever get hired in the first place if they weren't going to be loyal to me personally, Trump? Um, and the answer is the government is huge and there aren't enough true loyalist Trump fans in the world, probably, to fill the entirety of the United States government. And certainly n not nearly enough who are actually anything close to qualified, not that qualifications or the lack of qualifications have stopped the Senate from confirming people to important positions and that you couldn't somehow overly politicize these departments and just start hiring people more or less at random. I mean, they could be going to the diners where they are interviewing people for all these newspaper articles about how much they still love Trump and filling the ranks of the State Department from there. But Pompeo being, let's say, uh, equal parts maybe traditionalist, maybe lazy, maybe confused and stupid, maybe just not foreseeing exactly how bad Trump is and how loyal people would have to be to Trump personally in order to defend the things that are, you know, the, the, the things that are so awful that he actually has been revealed to be involved in. It would never have occurred to an incoming secretary of state, particularly one who came to the job a uh, well, from through Congress with a stop at the CIA briefly uh, before moving on to state. But that's an unlikely kind of person to have the idea that, oh, yes, we should politicize the department through and through, find whatever excuses we can to eject from our ranks actual trained foreign service officers who are civil ser nonpartisan civil servants and have served throughout administrations uh, regardless of the political leanings of the administration and instead replace them with randos pulled from diners. It's actually a difficult thing to do uh, if you follow the rules. And since, I mean, Trump has made it clear, I don't care what the rules are, I don't care what the laws say, just do the things I say and we'll be okay. He may have a point in all of this, right? I mean, you can't, simply dismiss civil servants that easily. There are laws in place for their protection, uh, both because it would be unfair to do to them what 
Trump would propose doing, and also because it would be bad for the country, and that's why we have the laws that we have. Uh, but Trump doesn't care about the existence of those laws, doesn't believe in their efficacy anyway, and he's largely correct about that because we dismiss this sort of tampering all the time. We did so with the George W. Bush Justice Department, and uh, partly as a result, we have a the, the most lawless, reckless attorney general of all time sitting atop a Justice Department that appears unmotivated to stand in his way for the most part, with the exception uh, somehow still of prosecutors in the Department of Justice who are doing things like convicting Roger Stone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we'll see how long that lasts. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it may very well be that Trump ends up firing those prosecutors and or pardoning the people that they convict. Um, but Pompeo, I think, was expected by Trump to just, with the snap of his fingers or the wave of a wand, push out all people who um, aren't personally loyal to Trump and didn't come from the ranks of Trump world and replace them with, if you have to, just plain idiots from hanging out in diners. What's the problem with all that? Well, you know, there's also rules about hiring people into the Foreign Service, and there's, you know, educational requirements and exams that have to be taken, and there's a very careful system of, like I said, examination and sorting and uh, um, evaluation and then placement. It, you know, it's a, it's a professional system, and you can't simply say as you can sometimes with uh, political appointee positions at the very top levels and uh, some of the ambassadorships, you can simply appoint whoever you want. And, well, you're supposed to have the advice and consent of the Senate. And these days, what does that even mean? Of course, if, you're, if you have the partisan control of the Senate, you get what you want, regardless of qualifications. Um, Pompeo never did this. It would be an enormous undertaking, an illegal undertaking, uh, not that that would bar him or anyone else who is a Trump loyalist from trying it. It's just it's very large scale and trying. And Pompeo doesn't strike anybody, I don't think, as extraordinarily energetic and ambitious and efficient. He's ambitious in the sense that if the presidency falls on my lap, uh, I'll be happy to take it. But that's it. Uh, taking on a project like this was never in the cards for Mike Pompeo. And Trump blames him for that. Not that Donald Trump would have had the energy or uh, uh, efficacy, really, and in, in even in executing this plan, even if he had such a thing as a plan, uh, he wouldn't have been able to do it either. He's even lazier than Pompeo is. But that doesn't stop him, of course, from taking it out on Pompeo for presiding over a department full of people who were put there under the normal processes and would ordinarily stand in the president's way of executing illegal foreign policy. Okay. In addition, he says, well, if you couldn't even do that, the least you could have done would have been to contact Yovanovitch and Holmes and uh, Taylor and Kent and told them, I will have your legs broken. You, I'll have you murdered. I'm going to have your body dumped in a river if you testify. Well, you know, I'm not going to do that because that's illegal. Also, I don't care if it's illegal. You should do it. And what's the big deal? You, you're afraid you'll get caught. You'll be convicted. I'll pardon you. I mean, I, I really honestly, yes, if you ever, if you really pressed me about it, did I really believe it? With Donald Trump, yes, I believe that he would, could, maybe even did tell Mike Pompeo, you tell those people not to testify or else. Meaning, and I don't know how, I don't know how much he would have confessed to if he had been able to tape the conversation. I don't know if he would have said, break their legs, murder them, give them to, give them the Jamal Khashoggi treatment. I don't know how he would have put it. Um, it may have been as vague and television movie, uh, um, what was I going to say, television or, or movie uh, trope, gangster trope, like th they're, going to ex they're going to go through some things or time for some traffic problems, for instance, as uh, Chris Christie might have said, or, or for Yovano, she's going to go through some things or whatever, make vague hints. I think he's actually literally furious that Pompeo didn't make dark 
possibly physical threats against the people who ended up testifying, and he blames him for doing that. So, back onto the article. Okay, so that's why he's angry. Inside the White House, the view was that Trump just felt like, rein your people in, a senior administration official said. Trump particularly blames Pompeo for tapping Ambassador Bill Taylor in June to be the top diplomat in Ukraine, the current and former senior administration official said. Another tangent point here. Uh, who appoints president, uh, uh, appoints, uh, I've given away the answer. Who appoints ambassadors? We need an ambassador to Ukraine because Yovanovitch is bad news. Well, whose job is that? The president's job. Now, yeah, sure. A lot of times he's not going to have ambassadors in mind for every single country or even every single, as he would say, major country, right? Ones that are important to him which Ukraine isn't, as we found out from the Holmes deposition opening statement on Friday. I haven't even gone into that. But um, surely he selects in many cases from lists that people suggest to him, whatever. Uh, but as I said, this is this whole other angle on understanding Ukraine and, and its importance to Trump. Uh, besides what Holmes had to say, uh, in the hearings Friday, Yovanovitch, um, not the depositions, Holmes, but in the hearings, we learned uh, that the Republican tactic with her was, uh, you know, to, well, they were pressing her on her lack of loyalty to Trump, et cetera, et cetera, um, and trying to make the case that. Trump was, in fact, you know, not looking to get Biden investigated in particular, but rather that he was genuinely concerned with corruption as a problem in Ukraine. They spent a lot of time trying to establish and get uh, Yovanovitch, as they have uh, tried with others in the past, and they've gotten what they wanted out of them. They ask all the diplomats, does Ukraine have a corruption problem? And the answer is yes, it does. And they're happy to tell, well, they may be unhappy about it, but they're, they're willing to tell you, yeah, absolutely. I'm unhappy that it has got this problem. I'm happy to tell you about it so that we can do something about it. And we had, in fact, as a matter of foreign policy, a comprehensive anti-corruption program that we were trying to guide the uh, Ukrainians through in all of this. And that's how much the United States government outside of Donald Trump, was really concerned with, uh, with corruption. But he, uh, uh, Trump tries to cover up the fact that he was aiming for Biden by saying corruption generally very bad there, and I was very worried about it, and so therefore it's a legitimate question to ask. Well, shouldn't we be investigating these problems of corruption? We've pointed out in the past, one of the problems with that, of course, is he started with one of the smallest pieces of corruption, I mean, there was a considerable amount of money at stake for an individual, Hunter Biden, to be getting, as they said, $50,000 a month. Seems like a lot, especially considering that he isn't particularly or wasn't particularly knowledgeable or skilled in the topics uh, dealt with at this company, I guess. Although, you know, so far I haven't heard him say, yeah, I really was, but maybe that's his position. But... Uh, $50,000 a month, even after month after month after month, year after year after year, where, and he was only a director for a couple of years. We're still only talking about, I mean, only. It's a couple million dollars. But the scale of corruption in Ukraine, the kind of corruption that makes it uh, the kind of country that has this terrible reputation for being mired in corruption, is because billions of dollars are being stolen through corruption there. 50,000 at a time is really, really small bore, really low level corruption compared to the systemic corruption that is supposed to be the justification for investigations, whether they focus on Biden or not. But on top of all of that, you might wonder if corruption was such a problem, it was so readily identifiable as the problem plaguing Ukraine and Ukraine being a frontline nation and 
fighting for its independence against incursion from Russia and wanting to westernize, possibly want to join NATO, possibly join the European Union. Normally, good things, considered to be good things by American presidents, we don't have one now. We have a guy who's president of the United States. He's just not American in his orientation. He happens to be Russian in his orientation and regards Ukraine's interest in westernizing and joining NATO and joining the European Union as a bad thing because NATO and the European Union are bad things to Russia and presidents who have Russian orientations. So he was upset about that and wanted that to to stop. He wanted feet to be dragged and I wanted to make it impossible for them to reach that goal. Anyway, um, what's concerning of course, is that, uh, or, or what, what's inexplicable in all this, if, if the President Trump was actually concerned about what was happening in Ukraine, cared about Ukraine, or even cared about corruption in general, and not so much Ukraine in particular, at what point during the three years that you've been President of the United States, were you going to find us a name of someone you trusted to address corruption in Ukraine. When were you going to name an ambassador, even from off a list of people that you never heard of and had nothing to do with the people presented you and, and assured you that they were all loyalists? When were you going to get up off your ass and name an ambassador to Ukraine? Because Yovanovitch was a holdover, and that's why you hated her. Yovanovitch, or part of the reason, that was part of the justification for hating her when you were prompted to hate her by Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman and Giuliani and others. Uh, so she's a holdover. That's not your doing. Then Bill Taylor comes in. But even Taylor is only acting as ambassador, right? Acting! I almost forgot yeah, that we had the sound effect. He's only acting ambassador. And of course, he came. Now, he blames Pompeo for bringing him forward. But for reasons we just explained a minute ago, Pompeo isn't going to go out and recruit a fresh from troops at the rallies to find a new acting ambassador to Ukraine. He's going to say, I have a State Department. Uh, there's a whole department. They're full of them. They're everywhere. The place is stuffed to the rafters with diplomats who could act as ambassadors. I'll take one. And he took this one. But again, not the president's choice for permanent ambassador to Ukraine. Or permanent, well, you know. Uh, uh, official ambassador, fully trusted as the ambassador. He's, he's had no one in mind. He has nobody in mind who can address all the corruption. And that's because, as we learned through the combination of the testimony and depositions, hearings, etc., from Jovanovic and then newly from Holmes um, and also corroborated by others who heard, overheard this conversation, Donald Trump doesn't care uh, well, he doesn't care about black people like George W. Bush, but he, Donald Trump does not care about Ukraine. His inter he doesn't care about Ukrainian corruption either. What he cares about is, and he doesn't even care, to, to, to add to it, it turns out he doesn't even care about the investigation of the Bidens. What he cares about is that the public think that Biden is under investigation by Ukraine and therefore that he's a bad choice for president and therefore that Donald Trump should be reelected. He doesn't care whether the investigations actually happen just so long as they're announced. Although I th I'm sure that he would like at some point, uh, he would then prevail on the people who made the announcement. Well, now I want you to make another announcement. And that's a, that's by the way, a good reason to not enter into the deal with him. If you thought the deal was you're going to get your javelin missiles and a meeting in the white house. If you publicly announce that there's an investigation, but don't think that he's going to come back to you and say, well, now it's been six months and I need you to announce the results of that investigation. But we didn't actually do the investigation. You just said you wanted I, And I don't. I don't want the investigation. I want results announced. Make them up and announce them. And he would be eventually pressuring you to do that. Best for you that this get blown up right now. Quite honestly, at this point, President Zelensky should flip as well and just say, yeah, you know, I forget it. No more pretending that I didn't feel threatened. I did feel threatened. I now realize that this wasn't going to be the end of the threats and I'll just fess up uh, to exactly what was going on here. But uh, that, I think, is an important part of this uh, and why Trump is mad at Pompeo and 
shouldn't be, but then it would just mean he'd have to blame himself and he can't do that. So that's not happening either. Once again, back to our article here. Taylor has provided the House Intelligence Committee with some of the most damaging details on the White House's effort to pressure Ukraine into investigating one of the president's potential rivals in the 2020 election, Joe Biden. A crack in the seemingly unbreakable bond between Trump and Pompeo is striking because Pompeo, former Kansas congressman, is viewed as the Trump whisperer who has survived and thrived working for a president who is routinely tired of and discarded senior members of the team. It just hasn't been his turn in the barrel, as Roger Stone might say, Uh, because no one's been paying attention to any diplomatic efforts because they know we have no diplomats. But the impeachment inquiry has put Pompeo in what one senior administration official described as an untenable position, trying to manage a bureaucracy of 75,000 people that has soured on his leadership. That's bad, too. And also please a boss with outsized expectations of loyalty. I think that's a much more concise way of describing what we, uh, what I expounded on earlier. But, uh, you know, they can't do it that way in the news. He feels like he's getting a bunch of blame from the president and the White House uh, for having hired all these people who are turning against Trump. Except, you know, 70% of the country really is against Trump and it's hard to find people from the 30% who are qualified uh, to fill these positions. So uh, that's the, uh, uh, what else was it? And that it's the, he also feels Trump does that. It's the State Department that is going to bring him down. So that's all Pompeo's fault. Neither the White House nor State Department responded to requests for comment. Four current State Department officials have testified before the House Intelligence Committee. Three of them, Taylor, uh, former ambassador to Ukraine, Jovanovich and George Kent, the deputy assistant secretary for the State Department in charge of Europe appeared before the committee last week to deliver the first public testimony. You know all about that. Uh, Taylor was dining in the State Department cafeteria the day after he testified over the administration's objections and was surrounded by employees expressing support for him, according to two people who saw him there. That sounds pretty interesting. Kurt Volker, who was the State Department's envoy on Ukraine. And, and here, that's another thing, right? He, what is this job of like a special envoy to Ukraine? If you hate Yovanovitch and you don't care one way or the other about Taylor, or now you claim you didn't want him in the first place, I think what happens, you didn't care one way or the other. You trusted Pompeo. That was a mistake, but only because Pompeo is not going to do what you think uh, a president or a, a secretary of state should do. Snap his fingers and magically populate the State Department with Trump loyalists. But uh, if he had somebody, Volcker, uh, well, I don't know. Does he blame him for Volcker or is he OK with Volcker? Because Volcker so far has been telling the Trump story. Why didn't they appoint Volcker, I guess, as even as acting ambassador to Ukraine? I'm not really sure why that didn't happen. Anyway, Volcker, who was the State Department's envoy on Ukraine until last month, was the first official to testify. He resigned about a week before his October 3rd deposition. Uh, Trump has hinted publicly at tensions with Pompeo, and while the comments might go unnoticed by the untrained ear, they've been heard loudly by people close to the president. The first was on October 23rd, officials said, when Trump wrote on Twitter, it would be really great if the people within the Trump administration, all well-meaning and good, I hope, in parentheses, could stop hiring never-Trumpers who are worse than the do-nothing Democrats. Nothing good will ever come from them. Trump followed up with another tweet specifically calling Taylor and his lawyers never-Trumpers. Two days later, Trump said Pompeo, quote, made a mistake in hiring Taylor. Here's the problem. He's a never-Trumper, and his lawyer is, the president told reporters about Taylor. The other problem is, hey, everyone makes mistakes, Mike Pompeo. Everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> Uh, except me, of course. Anyway, the next day, October 26th, Pompeo was notably absent as the president sat with his national security team during the U.S. military raid that killed ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Oh, I didn't even register that, I don't think. Pompeo was not informed about the raid until late Friday after he was home in Kansas for his son's friend's wedding, officials said. Wow, that's pretty cold. But the president was angry when he arrived in his private dining room on October 29th, two officials said. Pompeo defended himself, officials said, by telling Trump he doesn't know 
who half these State Department officials are, officials said. He also noted that there are thousands of employees at the agency, explaining that he can't control them. Those familiar with the matter said that, I'm sure, pissed him off to no end. One official said, Trump and Pompeo patched things up during the lunch. Mm, um, um, lunch, that makes me feel better. And he wasn't hangry anymore. They should have just given him a Snickers bar to begin with. Well, that may have been what he ate for lunch, plus some gravy and two Diet Cokes. We'll be right back. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning, and I've learned that I either need to update these announcements more often or stop saying that the announcements are brand new. What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the KGRO in the Morning show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that KGRO in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday, but our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents. One thin dime. We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to Patreon.com slash KGROX to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. Welcome back to the Kicker on the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, you know what I'm not finding in here is the uh, reference that Phil Burrow was making to reconstructed transcript. I guess uh, at some point <clears throat> in this article uh, that uh, Andrea Mitchell was tweeting around, there's a reference in passing, I would guess, because I've kind of scanned the rest of the article, but a reference in passing to uh, the, you know, blah, 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 something, something, according to the reconstructed transcript of, I don't know whether they're talking about the July 25th call or what, uh, but Phil was just sort of making the point, I think, to Andrea that uh, the word is doctored here. You should say doctored transcript, not reconstructed transcript. And hoping to uh, get Mitchell on board, I guess, with that terminology. And it might not even be uh, beyond the pale to think that she might eventually move to that. She was pretty outspoken in her on-air analysis of what was going on during last Wednesday's hearings. So it could be possible. But I don't actually even see that reference in here. So uh, at any rate, it was all very interesting regardless and gave us a lot to talk about a lot more than i thought we uh we had out of this article you know, i might not have grabbed it based just on the headlines but actually i'm appreciative of the opportunity to read through it because it, it gave us a lot of tangents to explore speaking of which though the doctored transcript thing have we discussed this or not i am not certain whether we made mention of it you've undoubtedly heard it by now but just for the record uh, when they did finally release the transcript, or that may have been a reconstructed or doctored transcript as well, of the April call, the one that Trump was so sure nobody knew about. Trump had two calls with Zelensky, one in April after he was elected president, just saying, well, was supposed to say congratulations on being elected president, but he took it all over the place. And then a second call, the July 25th call, was uh, the premise of the call there was congratulations on the results of the parliamentary elections, which has given you an absolute majority in the parliament, which is sort of a rare thing. And it looks like you're going to be able to implement your awesome agenda, whatever it may be. So congratulations on that, too. But while I have you on the line, uh, I need a illegal quid pro quo bribery extortion thing. So they went into that later on. But the April call uh, had been reported, which is another one of those things like, oh, nobody knew about it. Well, it was reported by the press that you had had this call in April. It was just that we all thought that it was an unremarkable conversation because what usually happens with these is that the readout, as they call it, is released to the press. That is not a transcript, but is... Instead, a generalized summary of the topics of conversation as between the two leaders. 
And ordinarily, a transcript is not all that informative, not something that they actually want floating around out there usually anyway, and not of any particular use to the press and a normal presidency because if the readout from the White House says that the two leaders discussed the terms of, oh, you know, developing trade relationships between the two countries, uh, perhaps even a mention of uh, anti-corruption efforts that the United States might be helping with in Ukraine or, uh, you know, defense assistance in their fight against Russian-backed separatists, etc. Uh, if the if a normal White House puts that out, you can be pretty sure that that was, in fact, the topic of conversation. Now, I did happen to find out, and I wonder if I have a story about this in pocket somewhere. Let's see. Um, I'll make a note to myself here. Uh, are you paying attention, Scott? This is the readout versus transcript article. Uh, I saw somewhere that there was a description of the process that usually takes place in putting out one of these readouts that prior to, again, in a normal White House, prior to a call like this being placed, the National Security Council staff will prepare a memo for the president. And again, in a normal situation, the president reads that memo because he wants to do well in his call with the upcoming, you know, in his upcoming call with a with a uh, another world leader. And they'll put into that memo, here are the things that you should talk about. When you speak with him, you should mention this, you should mention that, or do not congratulate. If that, you know, happens to be the case, you're talking to Vladimir Putin and he's cheated to quote unquote win re-election as president of Russia. Do not congratulate because everybody knows that he did that. And if you congratulate him, everyone will think you're congratulating him on cheating. And then Donald Trump goes and does that for various reasons. But okay, normally you get that memo and you read it and you do those things. And and there wouldn't even be strong objection to being led around by the nose as president of the United States. You you might think they might push back on such things. And I'm sure occasionally when there's substance involved that they do um, but you might think that the president would, you know, brand new to the job, let's say, would say, don't you tell me what to talk about on the telephone. But I guess you probably pretty quickly realize, one, the advice is usually pretty good. And two, what am I going to say to the president of Ukraine? I don't know him. I don't know anything about him. The only thing I know about him is what I read in this memo. It's not like we're good friends or anything. And I guess if you were talking to a guy who happened to be a good friend, you went to college with Vladimir Zelensky somehow and he gets elected president. Wow, you're president, so am I. How how amazing is that? You know what? You don't need to tell me what to talk about. Or, you know, uh, I don't you don't have to tell me how to socialize with the guy. But for the most part, you don't know anything about what the hell, you know, what will be interesting to the Ukrainian president. So the NSC staff tells you, and you're grateful for having that kind of guidance in a memo, because otherwise there's a lot of dead space in your conversation. How's the weather in Ukraine? I, I, I don't know. Congratulations on being elected president. What's uh, what's on TV in Ukraine tonight? So now you have intelligent things to talk about. But Donald Trump, of course, takes these memos, throws them out. They don't have pictures in them. He can't read. That's another problem. I can't comprehend what he can read. And it's boring and stupid. And I know all I need to know about Ukraine because Rudy Giuliani told me they're corrupt, horrible, horrible people. I don't want to read all this garbage about what to talk to him about. And it's clear that he doesn't because... Uh, for instance, uh, he does, as it turns out, from the maybe transcript of the call, spend some time talking about the Miss Universe pageant, which wasn't in Ukraine, but he wanted to point out Ukraine is always very well represented, by which he means, oh, Miss Ukraine always had, you know, big boobs. I don't know exactly what exactly would he notice. Maybe he's more of an ass man. I have no idea. I'm just saying that that's his idea of small talk. Well, I was watching the Miss Universe pageant and Miss Ukraine was very, very attractive young lady. And so that's nice. You want to talk about that? No, you know, we have real things to talk about here. So you're, you usually would follow the guidance of a, of a memo like that because that's the case. As it turns out, very often the, well, I'm not sure that it's done in all administrations quite the same way. But in this case, the word is that the Read out of the call 
the topics discussed that they released to the press was written before the call took place. Now, how can you do that? That's ridiculous, right? What if the president ad libs a little bit? For the one thing, normal presidents simply don't ad lib very often and things like that. And two, it would be an unusual event. You'd probably catch up and fix it after the fact. But uh, with this president, no surprise, he goes off script all the time. So it's probably not a great idea to pre-script or pre-write the readouts because one, it's not a good bet that he's going to follow your advice from the memo. And two, uh, he's probably going to ad lib and an honest readout that was complete would have to then be rewritten and include some of this stuff. But they may have come to the realization that it's best for all if we simply leave it the way it is. One, who needs the extra work and the extra headache? And two, uh, it's probably best if the official record of this presidency makes it look like he was a competent president on even on things, you know, minor things like calls with the presidents of other countries. If we go back and rewrite the readout the way the call went, it's going to look like the president is incompetent and or the National Security Council staff is incompetent, not briefing him. How could the president have spent all of his time talking about the Miss Universe pageant? Uh, didn't you brief him? Now, it may be that most of us finally have learned that, the, you know, of course they briefed him, but it didn't matter. He threw the briefing out because he can't read um, or he was defying you intentionally. He's got, uh, you know, some kind of defiance disorder. And that's maybe <laughs> another problem we have to deal with. But um, uh, uh, or perhaps worse out there is the possibility that this is left that way intentionally so that, uh, you know, you can cover up for as long as possible how incompetent the administration is. But maybe, maybe you can leave behind a paper legacy that made it look like they were actually doing the right thing and covering all the bases uh, for all this time. Um, so, uh, that's one of the things that was, that underlies all of this. And I, I, and now I'll have to see whether I can find it. Um, this, uh, article or this, uh, I think it was a tweet thread that actually referred to, uh, how this process actually worked. But in a, uh, that wasn't even, um, the main story about the question of whether or not the, uh, the transcripts had been, or the readout had been doctored in any way. The big news from that, and this is the part you've already heard, I am sure, is that the president, uh, you know, in all the impeachment hearings, all the president's defenders have been insistent that he's worried about corruption in Ukraine. And the readout of the April 10th call includes the mention of the corruption issue having been discussed between the two presidents, because that's what a competent American president would have brought up in a call, even a congratulatory, perfunctory congratulatory call with the president of Ukraine. Only he didn't, which is actually pretty interesting because, of course, it's his position and all of his defenders' position that he's obsessed with combating rampant corruption in Ukraine. But in fact, he makes no mention of it whatsoever, even though the readout says he does, which is either an attempt by the National Security Council to make it look like the president did a good job when he didn't, or is evidence that the president was briefed on how to do a good job, but ignored the briefing and therefore didn't do a good job. And it's in the readout because it was supposed to be a part of the conversation and nobody's ever really likely going to find out about the fact that that wasn't actually mentioned because these things are not of very much interest to the press. They're simply going to report that he had a call with the president and that these things were discussed. And everybody knows from the olden days, back when the White House could be trusted with their paperwork, that they probably did discuss these things because why wouldn't they? The National Security Council said they were the right topics to be discussed all the president has to do is read the stupid memo and have the stupid conversation as 
prescribed. Of course, he's going to do it because what else is he going to do? And now we know the answer is he talks about, you know, the various, you know, uh, aspects that he enjoyed most, uh, most, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, most of all, uh, we'll just make it simple. They asked the aspects of the Miss Ukraine pageant contestants that he appreciated with the most vigor and gusto. Anyway, so that's it. They left that all out. Um, I think the Washington Post wrote about that particular readout situation on what was this? Was this, uh, yeah, this would have been their Friday midday filing here, the April 21st call, uh, and, and their acknowledgement of the fact that uh, all corruption discussion is missing from the so-called transcript, but was in the readout. And that raises the other point, which is, okay, so now the question really is, did they discuss corruption but Trump was somehow so distracted and angry about the impeachment inquiry that he forgot to include it in the transcript to prove his the, the very point on which his whole defense hinges? Or is it instead actually evidence that the White House is putting out falsified readouts of his calls with other foreign leaders? It's in most you know, I think most likely the answer is, yeah, they're putting out false readouts, which, of course, brings us back to the initial hint from Trump that they were, in fact, going to do just that. The first thing he did was accuse Democrats of putting out false transcripts. And so it's going to come back to him. All right. It may not be that the transcripts are what he's got wrong. Maybe it's the readouts. But. I don't think that does anything for his credibility to say, well, you said uh, he was going to put out a false transcript and he put out a false readout. You said clip, not magazine. Therefore, you're not qualified to talk about it. All right. That could very well be uh, a major point of contention going forward here. All right. Let's see. Speaking of all the hearings, uh, Greg also sent along Michael DeMauro's impeachment schedule for the week, just in case you want to keep up on things tomorrow, Tuesday, Jennifer Williams already being uh, uh, distanced from the administration. Apparently, um, both Trump people attacking her uh, and Pence people attacking her as well. Uh, I think she comes out of the uh, the Pence camp, but the Pence camp now is saying, "Well, she's a state. We, you know, when, when we were elected, we moved her into the State Department. She's a State Department employee. And Pompeo, he sucks. She's not our problem, Jennifer Williams." Uh, Vindman comes back to testify again on Tuesday. So does Volker and Tim Morrison. Wednesday, we see Gordon Sondland, Laura Cooper, David Hale. I don't think I'm familiar with David Hale. And then Thursday, Fiona Hill comes back. So a full week O hearings should be very interesting and uh, explosive and lots of pizzazz. Although I believe Bill says uh, he's moved on to using razzmatazz just to shake things up a little bit. I like it. Jazz hands for you there, Bill. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, a comment here from Bobblespeak. Our transcripts, now transcripts of truth <laughs> handle on Twitter. Bobblespeak saying, uh, if Trump's chief concern was corruption involving Burisma and Hunter Biden, and he would only release the military, uh, that is the military aid, until he was satisfied on that, and the aid was released, then that must mean that Trump himself had concluded the Bidens had been totally exonerated. Ha, that's a possibility. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, uh, I think we all know that actually he was just hands caught in the cookie jar and it's going to look bad. Uh, or they thought, well, maybe he thought I'll have more pressure points instead of being able to use the two pressure points of I demand an investigation be announced before you get this money. I'm sure he knew, well, these are annual appropriations. Next year, you'll be able to extort them again and say, I demand that you announce, even if you have to fake them, announce results finding the Bidens corrupt, and then I'll give you this year's money. And it, maybe he thought, all right, I screwed up the first one. It's not going to work, but I still have the chance to leverage it on them, uh, leverage them with it 
next year. And uh, I don't think he's going to get that opportunity. Or, I, But I, you never know. He may try it anyway. I, he is crazy. He may really just not know that he can't try it again. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Other stories that deserve some mention before we are out of here. Uh, you will, have sh- of course, have heard over the weekend about Trump uh, offering or, or I guess clearing pardons for three service members uh, accused and in some cases convicted in war crimes cases. That's something you could probably spend uh, a whole show on. And uh, uh, we won't uh, be able to do it justice, even with a whole show, quite honestly. But I, I think everybody had their attention grabbed pro- quite properly with that over the weekend. Lots of people who are uh, active military and uh, former military speaking out about that and the impact it's going to have on morale, uh, inside and outside, and just the, the way American armed forces are regarded in the world, of course, possibly putting um, members of our armed forces in danger if they're ever, if they were to fall into enemy hands and danger that they might be uh, tortured or abused in some way and, uh, you know, besmirching the uh, honor of the military for all the rest of them who served. I mean, what do you what do you say about that, that there's no difference between people who serve honorably and as humanely as might even be possible in the armed forces and, you know, and those who don't, those who murder and everybody pretty much gets the same thing. He's rest- not only pardoning them, he's restoring their ranks He's uh, putting those of them who were members of the special forces he claims to be reinstating. Although, I, interesting, I did see members of various special forces units saying, no, that membership in that is, is actually up to us. I don't know if they, they may believe that. I don't know whether that's really the case, technically speaking. But uh, it's been real interesting. And uh, I don't know how we're going to deal with this exactly. Um, but I guess now, from now on, you, you're going to have to uh, greet members of the military and active members of the armed forces and say uh, thank you for your service and or war crimes. I can't tell the difference and neither can the president, but uh, good luck serving under him as commander in chief nonetheless. And uh, they probably will not take that very well. I don't actually recommend saying it, but it's unfortunately the case. Uh, let's see. Other uh, bits of information that will throw out there today and tomorrow perhaps we'll get back to uh, the new news such as it is about Lev Parnas and the Ukrainian gang that couldn't shoot straight Uh, in particular the fact that apparently they believe that they were on a super secret mission personally assigned to them by the president of the United States sounds very promising but in the meantime let's take a look at this piece from David Farenthold uh, it's always good to catch up with David, what Farenthold is writing about. And he's been investigating and never gave up on the story of the Trump Doral Resort being selected and then deselected for the site of the G7 meeting next year. Uh, of course, he watched very carefully, watched the White House and Trump himself and uh, others making claims that, uh, well, you know, it's a perfectly suited property. It's not that I wanted to secure emoluments to myself i'll even do it for free uh, slash for cost slash for lots of money but not actually tell you about it or whatever uh but the the claims were of course that it was the perfect site no site in america was better it's not my fault i own the perfect site for the g7 meeting it just happens to be the case because i'm such a smart investor and now i'm going to make millions of dollars look away well that didn't fly with Farenthold, and he started asking, so what else was up for consideration? You made it sound like it won a competition. It's the best suited in America. What else was being considered? Because I wonder if you were to tell us what those other sites were, whether common sense or even some investigation might perhaps reveal a different story. Might it be the case that um, there were other better suited sites around the country and that you steered things toward Doral. We might not ever find that evidence, but if we were to find out that there were five perfect sites and then the not so perfect site of Doral, we might have our suspicions. So anyway, he uh, wrote up this piece and tweeted out 
an accompaniment of the piece. The search for a G7 site started with 10 options. This is the long story short version. Secret Service narrowed it down to four. Then they were told to ax two and add a new finalist. Trump's own Doral Resort. So that's where the perfect site, the best one in America, enters into the picture. So we'll uh, give you the quick organized rundown on that in the few minutes that we have left. Trump's Doral Resort was a last-minute addition in the search for a G7 site, newly released email shows. See, they get everything. Farenthold and Josh Dawsey on this one from Friday. Secret Service agents had identified four U.S. sites as finalists for next year's Group of Seven Summit, but then they were told to add a new finalist. Doral. Hmm. The President's Resort, according to an internal Secret Service email released late Friday. Our original itinerary of uh, looking at the sites and inspecting them included Hawaii, Utah, California, and North Carolina. That's, there were 10 originally, then narrowed down to four. The Secret Service official wrote, describing a trip that a team of Secret Service personnel took in July to examine the finalists. By departure, they had already cut to California and North Carolina and added Miami on the back end. Miami meant President Trump's resort near the Miami airport, which hadn't been among the original 10 sites that the Secret Service team had vetted. In other words, it wasn't even in the list of the top 10. Hmm. But it's awesome and the best, all of a sudden, at the end. Although vetting of possible sites had begun in late May, the official wrote on July 12th that yesterday was the first time we put eyes on this Doral property. Hmm. The official's email, and remember, again, oh, the Secret Service loves the place. It's perfectly laid out, all the lies, right? The official's email was released to the watchdog group Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. They're doing a bang-up job, which made a public records request and then sued when government agencies did not comply. It sheds light on the process that led to Trump's short-lived decision last month to award the Group of Seven Summit to his own business. The official was identified in the email as serving in the Dignitary Protective Division, but the official's name was redacted. The email does not make clear what the agents thought of Doral as a possible site. It includes the phrase, quote, although the property does present some challenges, unquote, and doesn't say anything about what the rest, but that should tell you all there is to know about it, is they're looking for an excuse to try to please the president, but no. It wasn't even in the list of top 10. And once they actually were forced to take a look at the place, they're like, well, we might be able to make it work. Uh, There's some challenges, though. The remainder of the evaluation, though, is redacted. The Secret Service planned to present Trump with the results of its examinations in mid-July and then let him make the final decision, the email said. Doral was announced as the site of the summit on October 17th. Trump canceled that plan two days later after bipartisan outcry. At the time, Mick Mulvaney said the Doral site had been selected after a thorough search process. Quote here was, It became apparent at the end of that process that Doral was, by far and away, far and away, the best physical facility for this meeting, Mulvaney said. Hmm. Well, in a news conference... He described a long search process that began with 12 sites, then whittled down the list to four, including Doral. None of that is true, right? He said Trump has been, Trump had been the one to suggest his own resort. What about Doral, right? But Mulvaney gave no indication that this addition had come so late in the process. The White House didn't immediately respond to requests for comment. Secret Service spokesmen declined to answer questions about that stuff. The Doral Resort has, of course, fallen into financial decline since Trump got into politics. The resort's profits apparently fell 69% in two years from 2015 to 2017. But, you know, this would have boosted its prospects some. And voila, all of a sudden it is included in the process at the last possible minute. Uh, and then, of course, the decision made and then quickly unmade at the last possible minute as well. But to, at least there are some backups, I guess. And the Secret Service has some ideas of where they might be able to move the G7 if it's not at Doral. So I guess that's good. Somebody did their job and actually checked out other places. It's just that there was never any real competition, per se. And far and away, far and away, the best physical site, except for all the other ones which were uh, considered beforehand and didn't present the same physical challenges that Durrell did. So it'll be very interesting one day if we get a hold of the rest of that stuff. 
Anyway, as I promised uh, tomorrow, perhaps, well, we'll see whether I break that promise. More information on Lev Parnas and his earlier dealings with the White House and the uh, very personal meeting, in fact, that he and Fruman had with President Trump at the 2018, I guess, Hanukkah party at the White House in which they were pulled aside for a private meeting and uh, Lev came away with the impression he had been given a secret mission by the President of the United States who doesn't know these gentlemen and has never spoken with them and maybe they're clients of Rudy and I don't know who they are. Anyway, up next, of course, is the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Justice Putnam. Let's see what's on his menu that we haven't already gotten to or maybe some of the things overlap. Let's see. A new Ohio law lets students invoke their religion to give wrong answers. Wow, that sounds like fun. I think I'd like to sign up for that. A Democratic victories in Virginia could help bring down Confederate statues as well. Good From Daily Coos Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. There's also news from international quarters. Let's see, Russia is moving three ships it violently seized from Ukraine last year to a hand, handover location today. That's something to keep an eye on. And the widow of a Russian dissident, Alexander, oh my goodness, can't even tell you that, conveniently poisoned another one with polonium in 2006.